Hello. So we have 171 people who were reported missing in Bulgaria in 2013. Of course, this is a sad statistic, but I might ask, how do we know this number is true? Where does it come from? And usually the way this works is we have some police reports, some police chief goes in front of a camera, mentions it in an interview, the number went up, went up on a website, and usually the way you and I learn about it is when some of our more weird friends shares it with some conspiracy theory about people stealing our kids. And all that seemed quite fuzzy to me, so I started asking questions. Who are those people? Uh, why they disappeared? Is there some city or period of time where more people went missing? And, of course, the best way to answer this is to look at the actual reports, to look at the data. And, as you might guess, we don't have that data. Uh, I went to the police, they didn't give it to me because they're notoriously secretive. So, what I did was, facing such a problem, I started searching for a technical solution, and this is how Lipsaw was born. Now, Lipsaw, with the help of 100 volunteers online, we collected reports from police uh, websites, from news media, from families of the missing. We even got pictures from Facebook and cross-referenced their last-known location with four square check-ins. So, over time, we got this reasonable data set. You can see some of their pictures here. And I actually found something in interesting. Investigators were visiting the website to find better pictures of the missing. And some of them were even sharing the site, because, as it seems, it's easier to find information on Lipsa than on the real police websites, which, of course, stands to prove that social networks and search engine optimization should not be ignored even in police work. So, over time, we build up this data set, and I started charting it out, analyzing it, building maps like this one. This is a heat map of all the missing people in Bulgaria. And I was trying to search for answers, but no pattern emerged. You couldn't see anything that stood out. What I did find over time was that my initial questions were naive. I was asking the wrong questions. So instead, what I should be asking is, why are elderly people less likely to show up on media once they go missing? Why are some kids disappearing a couple of times a year? Why are Bulgarians who go missing abroad uh, rarely being reported? And also, what is actually the definition of missing? Apparently, that differs across countries. So I took these questions, went to the police, and surprisingly, I got straightforward answers. They were actually happy that I didn't ask for conspiracy theories. And it seemed that actually I had to have the right questions to get the right answers. And from that experience spawned my quest for transparency and open data in Bulgaria. And I'm talking about open data because, like Lipsva, this is the technical side of things. This is what I like to call automated transparency. And what it basically is, is structured, reusable, and machine-readable information. So please know scan pages, no PDF reports, no proprietary software. It also needs to be well-documented and freely licensed so we can actually use it. And once we have all of this, we can make some really cool stuff. We can re remix it, mesh it up with other sources. So you can make charts and inform the electorate about different policies. You can gain insight on how those policies were created and get answers to some big questions like society and politics and energy. The big promise, however, of open data and transparency uh, is that they're going to restore trust both in public and private institutions. And because of all these promises here, there's this big hype among art, uh, activists and politicians alike. And this is all very nice. It's kind of weird that we're looking for a technical solution for something that's actually a purely human problem, like trust. But what's even more interesting to me is that all of this is wrong none of this is going to actually work. Because when you actually look into the data, you don't see answers. The answers get more and more ambiguous. And when we talk about trust, transparency is about opening windows. What you look through the window influences your trust, not the fact that you open the window itself. So instead, when we see data, when we see transparency, what we should be expecting is questions. 
Because in the end, you, the questions is what really matters. Because with questions, you find out what you didn't know, what you didn't expect was there. And I'd like to show why this is true. Let's start with budget transparency. Now, in 2012, the Bulgarian government mandated that all government institutions should publish daily reports on how they spend their money, what payments they make. Unfortunately, we didn't get individual reports like for a company or a person, we just got reasons like salaries or maintenance, etc. So they released the data and everybody was very enthusiastic because we can finally see how our, our money was spent or wasted, depending on how you view things. So unfortunately, they forgot to say what the format should be. As I said, structured is a very important thing. So we got something like this. This is a PDF file with a scanned web page inside. So half the characters are missing, and as you can guess, it's not really usable. We have variations of this across all government institutions. Hopefully, they will fix it, but some of them actually bother to publish Excel sheets. And we can kind of work with those. So we can download them, put them into some nice format, and make something like this. Now, this is a dashboard which shows all the data. And I like data dashboards because you can put everything inside with minimal assumptions from the guy who's working on the thing. And you can allow the user to inspect all the information we have and find things for himself or herself. So we did inspect this, and we've observed some interesting things, like 26 million euro just in the past year was spent on other needs. That's it. This, of course, begs the question what these other needs are. Coincidentally, these payments come in the exact same times that the big anti-government protest came along, as do the 10% bump in salary. There's no information anywhere on where these payments went on why. We also see 160% in immigration, as you can see also in the chart, coincides with the surge in Syrian refugees over the past few months. Now, since they got so much more money, that, of course, we should ask why the, are the refugee camps in so poor condition. But even looking at all that information, it didn't tell us where this money went. It didn't tell us how it was spent. And when we start looking deeper, we found out that this is part of this whole story. The police uh, takes a lot of um, donations, and these donations are not include, included in this data. There's a lot of other payments which are also not included. So looking at this information, we don't see the full picture. So any answer we get, any insight we get is not the full story. But we are getting questions, which are important questions, and we can ask them. But of course, budget, public budget especially, is a very fairly complicated issue. So let's go to something simpler like birth. So in Bulgaria, we have a registry which shows us for each day of the year how many kids were born in each region in Bulgaria. Actually, we have quite a lot of registries. We have registry for pretty much anything. So at any point, if some public official decided we need a, some transparency, they made a registry in some format that in the end nobody reads. But this registry is fairly simple. You can have a map, you can select a period of time, and you can view it. But I didn't like the way their map looked like, so I downloaded data and made my own. You can compare it with previous periods, with population, with different age groups. You can also make, put it up on a calendar like this one. And this calendar actually gives us a very interesting discovery. Apparently, woman physiologist has adopted it in such a way not to give birth on Friday the 13th <laughs> and on weekends, which here you see in red, significantly, well, over 50% actually. And I guess we need actually a doctor to ask this, some phenomenon. And you can't really argue with this. This is data, right? It comes from the registry. So after discovering these things, we, in the end of the year, we got a final number. It's close to 64,000 kids were born. And everybody was angry. There was these huge articles about how Bulgaria is dis disappearing, how the internet is not letting young people have kids. Because this was significant, actually, because there was over 10% drop from the official number of the National Statistics Agency from previous year. 
And that's, this is huge. And everything blew off after a couple of weeks, as it happens. And a couple of months later, the National Statistics Office come out, comes out with their number, which is significantly larger. Almost 6,000. This is number for 2012. For 2013, 5,000. What's going on? Why is this so different? And at this point, I started again asking questions. After a couple of emails, I got the answer, and later it turned out that I'm the only one who, got, who asked those questions. Turns out that the health, Ministry of Health counts how many kids were born in hospitals, while the National Statistics Agency counts how many kids got birth certificates. And that differs, because some kids are not born in hospitals, they're not checked up in hospitals, they're born abroad. So we have 6,000 kids who are born outside the country. And this is a very interesting thing, because apparently nobody counts those kids. Nobody knows how many Bulgarians are outside the country, let alone how many kids they give birth to. Um, so when we dig deeper in the data, we found out that the National Statistics Office counts the kids in the region where their mother lives, which may differ from the region where the hospital is. So we can make a map like this, showing in red the regions where significantly more mothers gave birth. And we can use, of course, this to say, OK, in these regions, maybe the hospitals are better. But when you dig deeper into the data, you find out discrepancies, like the fact that the, there's no oversight where the hospitals fill in their reports. So about 15% of the reports come at least three months later. Uh, also, the National Statistical Agency doesn't necessarily count the kids who are registered later, born abroad, but registered six months later. So in the end, maps like this are very good for presentation slides, but not so good for making research or policies. So, at this point, all of this may be a bit confusing, and this is okay because I like this quote from Tom Peters, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention. And I think this underlines the idea about transparency because it tells us that uh, the more we look into the information, the more problems we find. And in the end, we end up with more questions. And of course, you may ask, okay, what if we actually have good data? In the first example I gave, we didn't actually have the data. And this is true, but let me ask you this. I guess most of you work in some sort of organization, public or private. When was it that you could work with any good data? I'm not talking about public data, your own. It's either mistyped or there was a problem with uh, collecting the information, it was badly documented, or it wasn't even used to make decisions. More often than not, decisions are taken on guesses and prejudice than on action actionable data. So if we ask the government for some, to release some information and they don't give it to us, it may be that simply they don't have it. And they're actually afraid to say that they took some bad decision based on prejudice. So usually what we end up working with is information which has conditions, which has limitations, and we have to understand those limitations to draw conclusions. Also, a lot of people quote uh, that transparency actually should give us uh, uh, answers, but we have questions instead, and questions are very important in my view because they indeed broaden our understanding of the world, and they're actually better because we see things that we didn't know were there. People quote Goethe for this and say that where there's much light, there's a lot of darkness, and this is usually used to describe the fact that governments and public institutions, and even private institutions, use transparency to conceal things, to show us what we want to know, what we expect to see, but hide some, something else. And as I said, questions are important because op uh, the strength of open data is it's like a flashlight. It allows us to point in different directions and illuminate those hidden spots. And questions show us where these spots are. So it's very important that we have the right questions to get the necessary answers. Now, what we can do about this? What we can do is push our government to open up, to release information in some understandable, structured way. Uh, there's a very nice initiative called Open Government Partnership. For European countries, there's also a re resolution of the uh, European Commission, which came out recently, which we should adopt as soon as possible. 
we can release our own information that can be from research, that can be information that we got from the government per request. Uh, and it's very important that we adopt open data. We have to use it in our research. We can use it in investigations. It's very important that we also tell stories and make charts with it because, let's face it, open data and data in general is very boring, looking through sheets of information and tables. So we need to put some background story. For journalists, that can be an article. For activists, that can be in a chart or leaflets so that the white public can benefit from that pub public good. And finally, we shouldn't be afraid of questions. That means we're doing the right thing. Thank you.